Hi, this is the third segment of our conversation with Professor Michael Strong. Some people may fear that Socratic practice is not practical for covering content. Um, how do you integrate content with uh, Socratic practice? It's a great question, Luis, and it is a challenge. It depends on the nature of the content. On the one hand, with a course such as mathematics or physics, uh, 90, 95, 99% of the course needs to be more traditional content coverage. So the role of Socratic practice in many math and science courses will be a, as an occasional enrichment activity or to deepen students' knowledge of a concept, such as the concept of proof or force, um, where the reflection on the concept will be valuable to later on understanding. With respect to other kinds of courses, certainly in literature and also in history, one can understand the content of the course more as understanding concepts. History is a combination of, of course, understanding historical detail, factual detail, but also it really is understanding uh, what is happening in history. If the students have the facts without understanding what is happening, they haven't really understood history. Of course, conversely, if they understand what is happening without facts, they don't really understand what is happening. But I like to encourage Socratic practice, practice as a way to deepen understanding in any portion of the curriculum. And the Socratic practice is a good pedagogical or educational tool. In what sense? Um, often students get into the habit of what I call memorize and forget. Uh, I was a great student at memorize and forget. The teacher tells me what to think. I write down notes. I memorize it the night before, get an A on the test, and forget the next day. I think a lot of education amounts to memorize and forget testing. In that sense, it is often a waste of time. Um, but it's easy to measure. Conversely, when one discusses ideas, thinks about ideas, works hard to understand difficult readings, one is using one's mind actively. And in order to, as it were, measure or evaluate how one's been using one's mind, I always encourage writing because when a student writes an analytical essay, one can see the extent to which they are in fact developing ideas and learning to understand the relationship between evidence and reasoning. If there's a thesis, it needs to be defended. Socratic practice, we're constantly engaged in comparing an idea and support for that idea. So we are going through the process of writing an analytical essay in every conversation. So you can look at sort of two paradigms of education. On the one hand, there's one in which there are right and wrong answers, and there are realms where that's important because there is some factual data that always needs to be mastered. But on the other hand, there is the development of ideas and reasoning to support those ideas. Socratic practice is a fabulous pedagogical tool for that, and analytical essay writing is a fabulous way to measure the growth in thinking skills and reasoning skills achieved by means of Socratic practice. Um, through the process of Socratic practice, one as a student or students acquire certain skills, such as independent, the capacity for independent judgment. Why is it that these skills are useful in life and in the classroom? Well, great question. Um, I wanna, before getting how they're useful in life, uh, I want to point out that very often when teachers lead discussions, the teacher asks a student a question and has a sense of what answer the student ought to be given. And I wait until you give me the answer that I want before I reply to you and say, yes, Luis, that was a good answer. Um, that completely destroys independent judgment. It gives, or rather, it gives students no growth for independent judgment. In order to cultivate independent judgment, I put students in a situation in a classroom in which one student says one hypothesis, another student says another hypothesis, and I do not adjudicate between the hypotheses, forcing the students to look to the text to see if student A's hypothesis is stronger or student B's hypothesis is stronger. And bit by bit, uh, other students in the classroom, as well as A and B, defend their hypotheses based on the evidence. And because I am not adjudicating the dispute, they really have to struggle with the relationship between evidence and a hypothesis to see which is most true. I would say that's what we have to do in much of life. Uh, one is faced with different lawyers, different stockbrokers, different investment opportunities, different uh, career paths. All the time, one has voices from all sides telling what one to do. In the classroom, there's an artificial situation where you trust one voice, the teachers. But in real life, nobody can tell us exactly what the best path is for us. We have to determine the best path based on who we are 
and what we know about our options until and unless we can make good decisions in which we take what we are and who we are and who we want to be and understand who's deceiving us and who's not deceiving us, we're apt to be lost in life. And uh, in the classroom, how do you manage the expectations of students who really would like professor to deliver the information or the right answer? Well, in a certain sense, I enjoy disappointing students who want that, um, which uh, is you know, a little bit of an ornery attitude on my part. But very often, students do want me to give them the right answer, and you know, I simply refuse to do so. Sometimes I'll put them on the spot and say, if you want me to think for you, I will think for you. Do you want me to tell you what clothes to wear, what church to go to, what books to read, what movies to watch, what friends you can associate with? If you want me to do all the thinking for yourself, you know, I, I could tell you what to do. Or do you want to take responsibility for thinking for yourself? And at some point, most students say, well, no, I don't want you to tell me what to believe. And I say, well, then you have to start figuring out for yourself what to believe. Because if I continue to tell you what to believe now, um, you're going to be dependent on other human beings your whole life. And because I believe you'll be a stronger, more capable person in the long run if you start making your own decisions now, I'm going to insist that you start making your own decisions now. I'll give you all the support you need in terms of evidence, how to break evidence down, how to analyze texts, um, how to understand different points of view. Uh, I'm happy to be a coach and help you become a greater, better thinker, but I won't make the decision, the final decision for you about what to think. And what is the value of taking responsibility for one's uh, ideas or one's learning? Well, I, th I think in general, uh, people who take responsibility for their lives are happier and I would say better people. Uh, Insofar as students expect to be passive participants in a classroom, they're not typically taking responsibility. Uh, often students come into the classroom and expect to be entertained or bored, as the case may be, but they don't expect to come into the classroom with the attitude that any learning that takes place during that period is their responsibility. Um, I want students to acknowledge that learning is a situation in which, until and unless they take responsibility, real learning simply will not take place. And so I will force students, if necessary, by means of silence. I'll ask a question, and if no one answers, I'll say, well, I'm not going to provide an answer. I'll ask easier questions. I'll, I'll help them in terms of breaking things down. But until and unless a student says, well, what does this mean? What is this author saying? Um, even why should we study this? I need some initiative from the student going forward. Because if I completely entertain them, uh, I am not letting them build responsibility. And I see responsibility as a habit. We become more responsible people by steadily taking on more and more responsibility. And so I want them to buy into that ethos of personal responsibility and work with me so that they take on ever more responsibility. Ultimately, I want them pretty much managing the process by themselves uh, with me simply being a fellow participant, uh, with them being responsible for the learning process. And. Um in this process of learning, is consistency important? Well, for me, logical consistency is the core of Socratic ethos. Uh, Socrates asked, what is virtue, what is truth, what is justice? And tried to get his interlocutors to explain how their understanding of truth, justice, or virtue were logically consistent understandings. Um, for me, one can make sense of texts by understanding, coming up with an interpretation which is logically consistent. Sometimes a student will have a hypothesis about a text, but the evidence in the text contradicts that hypothesis. Um, and the evidence in the text is consistent with a different hypothesis. Initially, students aren't in the habit of thinking of themselves as logical thinkers or logically consistent thinkers. But in another sense, it's the most intuitive thing in the world. When one person contradicts another person, we almost always say, Luis, you just contradicted yourself. Luis, how can that be true? You just said that. Um, I want to take that very natural human impulse, which doesn't like contradiction, and help them to realize uh, the desire for logical, logical consistency is an extraordinarily powerful tool for understanding.